actual with an optical microscope was a complete dream in the 80s. Uh, then it became feasible in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, and now it's routine since early 2000s. Okay, so for many of you, uh, I guess that detecting a single molecule with the optical microscope is not a big deal. Um, it's a difficult experiment, but you do it on, on routine um, in many, many labs. And then how did you get there? Um, you got there because you have better lasers. You got there also because you have better probes, uh, more photostable, higher quantum yield, higher uh, extinction cr uh, cross-section. You also got there because you have better detectors, okay? PMT, fast uh, avalanche photodiodes, extremely low count rates, uh, ex low after pulsing probability. All this is helping you a lot. You also gained a lot from um, filters, okay? Dark rake filters, extremely flat, uh, sharp edges, bandpass filters, extremely high rejection, so you can uh, cancel out uh, almost all the, the backscattered light from the laser and, and Raman scattering from the solvent. So all this you gained a lot from this technology. But there's one item that, that is remaining, uh, and at some point we even forget about it, it's the optical microscope, okay? And that didn't change so much. The uh, microscope objective is still more or less the same, and basically it's limited by diffraction. So conceptually, you're still using a high NA microscope objective, like uh, Ernst Haber designed, actually. Uh, 150 years ago. So that didn't change that much. Of course, you have better uh, correction for aberrations. You have better chromatic aberrations correction. You have larger field of view, flatter field of view. But at the end, if you just want to detect a single molecule, you don't care about the field of view. Being millimeter square is absolutely no point. Just want to do this experiment, have a single molecule uh, as your object, excite it and detect it. And at the end, what, what you're limited is really depicted here in, in this cartoon. The best that we can do in optics is focus light on, on a spot that has a diameter that is the wavelength of light. So it's several hundreds of nanometer. And, and here is the size of your object, okay? A GFP, uh, length about four nanometers, diameter about two, 2.5 nanometers. As you can see, there's a huge size mismatch between the object that you want to see and the laser spot at best. And, and this is a physical limitation, okay? This, this is not relevant to your microscope objective. You take the best size, best Nikon objective, whatever brand you, you want. As long as you work with classical conventional optics, diffraction is going to occur. You can play a little tricks, but this diameter is always going to be a few hundred nanometer. Uh, which means it's going to be 100 times bigger than your object. And if we speak uh, as ratio, then you have a problem of uh, 1 to 100 in diameter, which means that as a surface, you have a problem of 1 to 10,000. So even if your protein is super absorbing, at best, your absorption efficiency is going to be 0.01%. And since most of your protein is going to be uh, empty, uh, the efficiency is going to be much, much lower. Okay, that's the first limitation. But then you tell me, okay, I don't care, I, I put milliwatt of laser power and whatever gets excited, gets excited. But there is a physical uh, principle in, 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 um, in general physics that if your system is lossless, then you can reverse time. Whatever goes in one way means light to the molecule, this is uh, one direction, then if it's lossless, it should go also the other way, emission to the, the, the microscope. So if your excitation is inefficient, then for a lossless system, your emission is also going to be inefficient. Which means that uh, what I'm telling you here is that diffraction also limits your ability to um, uh, collect the radiation from your emitter. So you, you lose on both ways. You lose on, you lose on the excitation and you lose on the ability to extract the energy from your fluorescent protein. So altogether, this is going to dramatically limit the amount of fluorescent signal that you detect. So diffraction here is really an issue. This is limiting uh, the net signal that you can detect from your emitter. That's the first problem. As, as you can see here, I have pointed out two problems. There's a second problem, which is about the concentration range. So 
even if the signal is, is there, and now we, we, we know we have a few uh, thousands of photons per, per second, the other problem is that you have a protein, you want to detect a single protein on your focus, that means that the next protein has to be away, sufficiently away by the size of your laser beam. So you need to that the neighbor uh, protein is away by at least a few hundred of nanometers in order for you to isolate and do real single molecule uh, experiment. And that means uh, as concentration, this is extremely dilute. This is nanomolar concentration or even less. Okay. And if you compare to what's occurring in a live cell, this uh, is diluted by a factor of 1,000 or, or even more. A cell is a crowded environment by, by, by definition. And, and here you are working in an environment that is a thousand fold more dilute. So that of course is going to affect uh, how your protein um, sets its conformation. It's also going to affect, of course, the uh, interaction dynamics with other molecules. Uh, and this is an example. Um, I, I took uh, more than 100,000 of different enzymes uh, on, on internet Brenda database. Uh, this tells you that most enzymes, this is the histogram of different enzymes, most enzymes, they require concentration in the orders of 10 to hundreds of micromolar. Right, but this is what you can probe with confocal, nanomolar or even even less. So, what this tells you is that if you want to do single molecule experiment on confocal and watch interaction dynamics, enzymatic reaction, for for instance, you have to be very careful about which molecule you select in order to have a um, a response that is uh, that is not affected by the dilution. Since you will be able to work only at nanomolar concentration, then you can probe only a very limited um, library of different enzymatic reactions. You cannot probe these ones. If you probe these ones, you work at concentration that is 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 more diluted, and then the dynamics that you are going to measure are going to be very different from the, the normal kinetics of these enzymes. So that's great, creating some artifacts. So what's the other problem? Problem one is the net signal that you detect. Problem two is the working concentration where you can isolate a single molecule in a crowded environment. So to overcome this limit, um, this is where we, 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 are, we are going. We want to uh, incorporate nanophotonics in the microscope. So you keep your confocal microscope, no problem. And just in, instead of putting a glass cover slip, you put a glass cover slip with some optical nanostructures we call them optical nano antenna. Uh, and these devices are, are meant to concentrate light uh, down to the nanometric scale. So this is meant to, to do the interfacing between uh, your laser focus, which is going to be on the order of hundreds of nanometer, down to a typical size of 10 nanometer, which is going to match better the size of your molecule, okay? So these optical nano antenna, nano structures, uh, most of the time they are made of nanoparticles, coupled nanoparticles, um, single or dimer. Um, these are made of noble metals, so gold, silver. A and due to the optical coupling between the, the particles, we can confine light, as you can see in this simulation, in a spot that is 10 times 20 nanometer, and locally we can enhance a lot the, uh, look, the intensity, okay, several orders of magnitude. So this is, this is nanophotonics, okay? Uh, the first effect is that you will be able to concentrate light to the nanoscale dimension, to sizes 10 times 25 nanometer, and have a high intensity. The other effect that when you put an emitter in, 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 in this place, in this, in this hotspot, then you can will increase the radiative rate of this emitter. And this is also by some argument of reciprocity or time reversal. If you are able to couple the, um, the photon flux into the local energy, then reciprocally, you are able to outcouple the local energy and send it back to a photon flux. So reversively, you will also increase the radiative rate of your emitter. And finally, you can also control the directivity of light by playing with the param parameters of your antenna. So all this uh, local intensity enhancement, increase in radiative rate and directivity control is going to boost a lot the fluorescent signal.
If you did not get completely this slide, no problem. My goal today is to explain you this slide, okay? So my, my real message and the purpose of my whole talk is going to have you understand what I mean here. So no, don't worry if, if that is going to be too far. Just here, what you can get is that we are going to put some nano device into the object plane of the microscope and with the aim that this nano device is going to help us manipulate light on, on the dimension that is below the wavelength and go to a dimension that is close to the dimension of uh, a protein. Okay, so we interface between the wavelength down to the molecular size. Uh, and with that, we can increase significantly the net fluorescent signal we detect per molecule. And the other effect is that since we are able to put light on 10 nanometer scale, then we can detect a single molecule in a highly crowded solution, okay? So we can go to concentrations that are a um, thousand times more concentrated than the normal confocal microscope, avoid the dilution uh, artifacts, and, and work with single molecule resolution, probing one GFP in a solution that has concentration of 10 micromolar of GFP. Okay, so pick one into a crowd. And this is because we are able just to concentrate light on a size that is, that is more or less equivalent to, to, a, to a GFP. Okay, so that's, that's the menu of my talk today. Okay, that was the motivation. Uh, but now I want you to understand a bit more uh, how it works and, and how you can take this idea and, and get them applied on, onto your, your device and, and microscope. So I, I need to tell you a bit about nano optics. Okay, there's going to be a very basic introduction. Um, if you didn't like your physics courses where you went in high school or um, freshman year in university, don't worry, that's, that's no longer the problem. Uh, we are focusing on present. So we, we are, we're going to see just the very basic of what's going on here. Because this is going to be able to take me then to explain you what's going on on fluorescence within these devices, okay? And this is, uh, you're interested in fluorescence markers. So of course, uh, what's the principle of fluorescence phenomenon in metal nano device, okay? In this, what we call nano antennas. And then we go on experimental demonstration. So this is real practical um, examples and answering practical question, how do I insert this into my setup? And then depending on time, I have some extra bonus for, for, for you just to show some other approaches to improve the microscope and, and whatever else you can do uh, with no fluorescence. So that's, uh, that, that, that's a bit funny. It depends on, on the time that we have. All right, introduction to nano optics. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking about nano antenna, and I think that this is a real uh, framework, and, and, and I would like to, you to see this type of question on the antenna basis, okay? So antenna, we have this in, in our mobile phones. Um, we are used to this type of things. And now we refresh and we rephrase the, um, the, the antenna problem and the, the fluorescence microscopy problem as an antenna question. So this is your molecule. This is your fluorescent molecule, okay? This here is your microscope. Your microscope is going to collect the radiation. It's going to collect fluorescent light, photons. And whatever you want to do is to have a device that transforms the local en energy, okay, that is stored into your fluorescent molecule and send it efficiently towards your detectors on your microscope. Okay, and this is really an antenna as an emitter system. And reversively, also you want to excite your fluorescent molecule. So this is your laser microscope system, light coming in on a diffraction limited spot. And this is your molecule again, and you want to excite it. And you want to send an incoming light radiation beam onto a local energy storage device. And this is again your fluorescent molecule. So that's again the antenna in a receiving mode. And we are always going to play with this question. Receiving mode is excitation, fluorescence excitation. And emitting mode, this is where you have fluorescence emission. Okay, various designs of nano antennas exist. So it can go from a single nano rod, two nano rod with a small gap, as you can see here, 
and even a collection of nanorods to control the directivity. There are various examples, and we're going to see them. But may maybe for, for, for chemists, um, a, a nice introduction to, to nanophotonics is the Lekogos cup. So this, this is a well-known example. Uh, fourth century um, after Christus, um, so this Roman cup, um, if you look at it in reflected light, it appears green, okay? So it's just greenish uh, glass. But when you look at it in transmission, then it becomes red. And this is quite a uh, fascinating system that whatever you look in reflection in, in, in all angles, it's green and in transmission it becomes red. Uh, and that's changing color. And so this is not classical photochemistry. This is not absorption. This is something more. It changes color dep depending on the way you look at it. Uh, so analyzing this uh, in detail, uh, you see that this glass actually is loaded with some nanoparticles, okay, which are made into some complex alloy. Uh, so Romans were creating some really weird nanochemistry of nanoparticles, uh, mixing uh, silver and gold. But whatever it is, it's still metal. Okay. So there, there are three electrons, and, and this is a metallic compound mixing silver and gold, and it's embedded in, into the glass of this cup. All right, so this is actually to understand a bit more, um, because there's something strange here, uh, to understand a bit more, then we have to look at what's going on. If we take uh, a metal nanoparticle, so we, 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 we take just gold nanoparticle, um, cylindrical shape, and we send light on it. So light is uh, an electromagnetic field. So it's electric field and magnetic field coupled. Here we forget about magnetic field. Magnetic effects are uh, orders of magnitude below the electric ones. So three, uh, four orders of magnitude below. So just safely forget about it. So just remember, uh, focus on light as the electric field. Okay, so this is light. An electric field, this is the nanoparticle. It contains three electrons. So when you send an electric field onto charged particles, what occurs is the Lorentz force. You have a force that is applied on the nanoparticles, which is the charge, so minus E for the electrons, times the E field. The E field is pointing in that direction, the charge is negative, so the force is pointing on the reverse direction. This force is going to push, pull the electrons. So the electrons are going to be displaced on one end of the, of, um, the nanoparticle and they are, will not be able to move further, okay? So one end is going to see an increase in the number of electrons, and the other end is going to see a loss in the number of electrons. So it's going to create a local charge. That's all, okay? So electric field pointing in this direction. You have an accumulation of electrons on one end, it's negative charge, and a loss of electron on the other end, which creates locally a plus charge. All right, this is static. Light is a wave and, and uh, is dynamic, so it's oscillating at a certain frequency. Orders are uh, hundreds of terabytes, but you, you forget about that. It's just oscillating. So half a period later, it has changed the order, okay? Before we had the E field pointing to the left. Now we have the E field pointing to the right. The E field is all oscillating left, right, left, right at the frequency of the light. So then the E field is pointing in this direction, then the force has changed the direction also. And then the electrons are pushed on the other end. Electrons are pushed now in this side. So we get a negative charge in here and a positive charge in here. And this is oscillating at the frequency of light. And over half a period later, you have that. And again, and again, and again, and again. So at the end, what you have um, is a plus charge oscillating at one end of the nanorod and a negative charge oscillating at the other end. And what is this? This is the most basic antenna possible. Okay. Actually, your fluorescent dye is working more or less the same principle also. You have an oscillation of charges, plus and minus. What is the net amount of a charge? I don't care so far. I just tell you that you have plus and minus charge oscillating at which frequency, well, the frequency of light, the driving field is sending you at a second frequency and this system is responding at the same frequency. 
So this is actually radiating light. This is a dipole, like your fluorescent molecule, and this is radiating. Okay, and then when we when we do the, um, the, the calculation, this is this is uh, this is the nanorod, the gold nanorod that we had. Uh, already, we see that we have a local increase of charge around the edges, and this gives rise to intense electromagnetic fields. So this is the, the, the very simple um, introduction to the physical origin of the intense electromagnetic field intensity at the edges here. And here you can see it goes one to up to 1,000. Okay. So locally here you can have a lot of intensity at the edges because the electrons are responding. Also, uh, this is extremely localized towards the tip. So again, see the scale bar, this is um, 20 nanometers, so here within 10 nanometer you have light that is concentrated. So this is the way also to get light focused on, on the nanoscale. And, and also since we have electrons moving here, uh, there is a current, and if you have a current, uh, you have losses, and once you have losses, then you have uh, a resistance and ohmic uh, dissipation. So this is again the, the current flow and uh, there will be absorption and heat in, into your device, and this is going to, to be the, the source of the, the, the loss and the increased temperature uh, if you put too much of light onto your system. Okay, so that's a very basic um, introduction to coupling light with a metal nano, nanostructure. Okay, we see this often in, in chemistry, this is this type of graph, um, which is nice, uh, but I find a bit difficult to understand. It took me some time to, to understand. Uh, what you have to understand that this axis here is, is time, okay? Um, this is your metal nanoparticle, and but this is as a function of time. So for a given time, the E field is pointing up, then the electron cloud is pushed down, and half a period later, this is still the same nanoparticle, the E field is pointing down, the electron cloud is pushed up, and then you have an oscillation of charges. This is exactly what I told you before in playing with the different slides. Just remember, um, to avoid any misconception, this axis is time. Okay, so then you have um, the, the response of, of um, optical, um, the optical response of a nanoparticle, so you can have two things, basically. The particle can scatter the light, so send light back into various angles, and can also absorb. So then light is lost uh, as heat in, into the device. And, and if we look back at, at this thing, absorption actually is due to is a problem of volume. So it scales as the diameter of a particle, while scattering actually is more a problem of dipole-dipole interaction. So it's um, as to the power of six of the, of the size. So in this case, uh, what I want to tell you in, the, in this slide is that scales matters to define whether you have a more predominance of absorption or more predominance of scattering. So for very big particles, like the one you have in milk, hundreds of nanometer in size, then scattering is dominating because this is diameter to the six versus diameter to the three. So big particles, scattering dominates. And you can forget a, a bit about the, the absorption. Okay, This is why milk appears big because particles are hundreds of nanometer in size. Reversively, for very small particles, like uh, carbon nanoparticles that we have in black ink, these are, uh, they have typical sizes of a few, four, five, below 10 nanometer of carbon. Uh, in this case, as the diameter is small, then this part takes the lead over this one, okay? So any particle that has a diameter below 20 nanometer is going to be a strong absorber for light, especially the nanoparticles in metal. Um, for the visible light, uh, any metal nanoparticle of diameter below 20 nanometer is a very strong absorber for light. So I, I see many uh, studies, um, uh, even theoretical studies in, in nanophotonics. People are focusing on nanoparticles that have diameter 10, 15 nanometer in size. Um, this is interesting, uh, and it makes probably the computation a lot easier because the, the size is small. But then you just miss a lot of the effect because what you have is an absorber. 
and an absorber um, for light is not so much interesting. You, of course, uh, are much more interested in the scattering where you can send beams in all directions. Okay, so back if we go to the Lekogos cup, uh, then it's possible to compute all these parameters. So when you have absorption, which is this blue curve, and you see that this, um, the gold nanoparticles due to some transition to uh, the specific properties of, of gold, they have a peak around 500 nanometer. So they um, absorb light in the green, which means that when you send light in transmission mode, then the green and the blue are going to be absorbed. And what you see in transmission is the red tail. So you see it red in transmission. And reversibly, the, 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 the scattering, the scattering has a peak in, at 550, uh, 600. So, um, so this at 550 is going to appear green. And this is why when you look at it in reflection mode, you see essentially scattering from the particles and you see it green. So you have these resonances, um, a peak in scattering, a peak in, uh, in absorption, and they are in intrinsically related to the, the permittivity, material property of gold. Uh, and, but this is well known. You can find it on the on, uh, internet databases uh, to show you some interband transition below 500 nanometer, um, highly conducting properties in the infrared, and some intermediate uh, properties in the visible. OK, so now we've seen the response of a single nanoparticle. I just need to go a bit uh, into, in, into another topic. I want to bring another na nanoparticle. Okay. And this is going to be the, the end of the introduction to the, of, the na of the nanophotonics. So we have two nanoparticles. I want to couple them. Um, what you know is that when you have a single nanoparticle, you get plus minus charges, plus minus. This is what we've just seen. Here, the gap is large, so there's no interaction. If I bring them closer, what we have here is a plus and a minus charge separated by a very, very small distance. And when you have a very small distance in this case and a large accumulation of charges, then the, the electric field can be pretty large. Okay? And you can compute what's this typical size of enhancement, what is the electric field in the gap respective to the incoming one. Then it's, it's a problem of material the real part of the permittivity, which is the effect that you want to have. Imaginary is the loss. The total size of your antenna, the total length of your antenna, this is how well it can uh, collect uh, light uh, as a first approximation, and the gap, what's the gap size. And since this gap size can be pretty small, then locally you can have an increase of a few hundred in E field which means that the intensity can be this to a square. So it can go to a 10 to a 4, 10 to a 5. If you have nanometer gap, it can go extremely high intensity gains. Again, because of this coupling between, between charges at very short distances. OK, uh, numerical simulation, we, we find this again. We had the nanorod before, with a peak of 1,000. Now we couple them. And locally, we can increase it even higher even this is, is as, as a gap about 15 nanometer, we go to 4,000. So there's a, there's a local increase, and this is the, the, the illustration I gave you in the introduction motivation part of this talk. Light is concentrated on a spot that is on, on the orders of tens of nanometer. Okay, and it's pretty much intense, much more than the incoming light. Okay, um, coupling the resonance, you have a response because all this is spectrally dependent. Uh, and this uh, goes back also to, to some um, uh, illustration about the, the energy levels of, of your coupled systems. If you couple them, then you create some new modes uh, where uh, they can be collaborative. So they will require less energy. And uh, some other mode, which is, uh, which is not going to be excited by, uh, by light uh, if easily because it's, it breaks um, symmetry and that requires a bit higher energy. Okay. And as you reduce the, the distance between the antenna, then you increase the, the, the shift uh, 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 between, be between the, the, the spectral resonances. So here again, uh, this is an important parameter to keep in mind. These nano devices are spectrally dependent. Okay. And depending on the size 
of the device that you take, you will have a resonance at a given frequency. And when you start coupling the, the particles, then this frequency is going to shift. Okay. The more coupling you have for the main dipole mode, then the more you shift to the red. Okay, and then there are design parameters. And these design parameters, you can compute them. Uh, you can look also in the literature and there are different systems that exist. Uh, essentially, for, for you, the question is going to be, um, I, I want to have the smallest gap possible, but uh, can still tolerate the molecule I want to put, because the gap size is going to be the major parameter defining the local intensity enhancement. And then uh, you can play with the length of a particle so that the resonance goes into the spectral region where you want to work. Okay. But all this can be tabulated and all this can be computed. Quite easily, there are commercial software, there are e even um, widgets on, on the internet that allow you to compute this uh, without any a priori knowledge. Okay, and finally, uh, a word about nanofabrication, because this, this is also something that, that uh, is important. Um, I will show you various examples of nanofabrication using a uh, bottom-up approach and top-down. So bottom-up is you use nanoparticles that are, that are synthesized by colloidal chemistry, so you can buy them and, and, and apply them directly on your substrate. So this is the, of some easy way. Uh, another approach, uh, which is more regarding towards nanofabrication technology uh, is the top-down. Top-down is going to mill um, the, the, the nanostructures on, on the glass system. So there are two major top-down approaches, and it's important for you just at least to, to know what are these techniques. So the first one is electron beam patterning. So electron beam patterning uh, takes advantage of an electron uh, beam focused on some resist. So you have a resist that is electron sensitive. When you send the le electron beam, it will insulate locally the resist, okay? And change locally its properties. Adding a solvent will allow you to remove part of the resist where you want. And then you can evaporate the metal and create here the antenna. And the as last step, this is called lift off. Lift off is re removing the rest, the remaining resist. Okay. When the resist goes away, you just have the antenna lying on your substrate. Okay. And this can give you uh, gap sizes at 10 nanometer with well-designed, um, well-controlled um, antenna parameters at specific locations. The other top-down um, approach is more like brute force. Um, this is taking advantage of gallium ions. Gallium ions are pretty heavy. So this is FIB, focused ion beam uh, milling. So you have your gold metal layer, and you're going to directly drill whatever you want uh, using a focused a gallium beam. Okay, so here and here you take advantage that these devices can focus uh, electron beams on spot size about one to two nanometer, and gallium beams, beams on spot size of five to eight nanometers. So that allows you to directly write onto uh, your, your films the design that you want. I agree it's a bit brute force, I agree it's a bit expensive, but on many, many campuses you have access to this type of uh, fabric uh, fabrication facilities, uh, and, and this is a, an access that you can then create the antenna, and you can reuse the antenna. This is a question that I often have. Yes, you can reuse the antenna, uh, depending on, 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 on proper manipulation, they can be used for, for several experimental runs. So it's not that complicated, okay? 15 years ago, probably it was an issue, but now you have access to these facilities on man, many, many different sites. All right, so that was the introduction to nano-optics. So we play with uh, metal nanoparticles, and we send light, and we excite them. Now I want to go with uh, what you are mostly interested in, is, is about fluorescence. What's going on with fluorescence in, in these systems? So let's go back, uh, back to fluorescence basics. Okay, so this is where you're, you're, you're more familiar. Um, I'm taking it as a very simple system, two-level system. I don't care about uh, triplet inter-system crossing or wh wh whatever here. Just two-level, you excite with a given excitation rate. Um, and then you can 
go down to a ground state by emitting a photon, this is the radiative rate, or go down to a ground state without emitting a photon, and this is all what I call the non-radiative um, internal conversion um, rate. Okay, the net detected fluorescence that you can have, this is just solving this uh, two-level um, system. Uh, so you pump with a certain rate, and then you go down with two different rates. At the end, what you have, and if you have a single molecule, just forget about this term, what you have is a product of three parameters. Collection efficiency, how well you collect photons. Quantum yield, what is the ratio between the radiative emission and all the other decay rates and excitation intensity, how much you excite your, your molecule. All right, just three parameters. Whatever you, you do at, at single molecule level at, um, in a regime where you do not saturate the, um, the transition, then you are um, proportional to these three parameters. Okay, so I say it again, the brightness per molecule is the collection efficiency of your microscope times the quantum yield of the dye times the excitation intensity. Okay. Excitation intensity, I put everything, uh, it's the excitation of the laser times the absorption extinction cross-section. So if you want to enhance fluorescence using your nanophotonic device, then there's not so much of, 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 of possibilities. You can just play on these three parameters. Improve the collection efficiency, but this is pretty hard since you use a high NA uh, microscope objective, so you collect already as much as possible. Improve the quantum yield of your emitter, and here, if you have a low quantum yield emitter, then probably you can gain a lot. And improve the local excitation intensity. Okay. Assume that the um, absorption cross-section does not change because of, um, of, of metal, but uh, this, is, this is an absorption. Wh whatever we do anyway is always the ratio of this uh, function. So this is where we are going to take the maximum advantage of the local intensity increase. Okay. And here also we are going to play with the physics of radiative rate enhancement. I want to clarify a bit. The quantum yield, you can always write it as um, the radiative decay rate divided by all the other rates, and all the other, the one over all the other rates is just the lifetime. So if, if I rephrase the quantum yield ratio, is the ratio of radiative rates and the ratio of lifetime. And here I just want to, to point out something, um, the lifetime reduction, okay? The fact that you have a shorter lifetime of your dye into the nanophotonic device does not mean that you have more fluorescence photons, okay? There's a real difference, and you can see it on, on, on this equation extremely simply. The fluorescence enhancement is different from the lifetime reduction. There are several papers um, published where there is a confusion on this. People sometimes tend to say, yeah, my lifetime is shorter, so I emit more photons. This is absolutely not true, okay? So don't get confused into this. Um, you can have a very short lifetime, but, but you can have also a dye that is completely quenched. And if it's completely quenched, you, uh, all the energy goes to the non-radiative um, internal conversion, and then you see, you see nothing uh, as emitting photons. Okay. So a short lifetime does not absolutely mean um, uh, um, a high fluorescence enhancement. Uh, actually, even here you see that a short lifetime is actually going to take down your fluorescence enhancement. Okay. All right, so I, I, w I want to uh, go on, on, on some um, experiment to, to explain you what's going to occur on, on, on the photokinetics of the fluorescence close to a to, um, uh, a metal nanoparticle. And, and here we take a, a quite um, illustrative experiment. This is not going to be the one that you will have the highest fluorescence enhancement ever, but uh, I really much like this experiment because uh, conceptually uh, it, it's really beautiful experiment. You have a single fluorescent molecule, a single metal nanoparticle. The metal nanoparticle is glued to the, um, to the tip of an elongated fiber. And, the, and this is connected to a near-field scanning microscope, so it's possible to move this metal particle respective to a frozen dye. So again, this is the sketch of the experiment. We have a single molecule, okay, this is Nile blue, this is embedded in a resist, so it does not move, does not rotate. Um, we select 
um, the molecules with a dipole that is pointing up towards the nanoparticle. And then we are going to bring the nanoparticle close to, to, um, to the molecule. Okay. The nanoparticle is controlled because it's glued to the tip, as you can see here. This is the gold nanoparticle. This is the, the glass tip. The glass is not going to affect the experiment here. And we are going to scan and move and play with this distance, bring it closer. And on this axis, you have the tip, uh, the nanoparticle to molecule distance. So at very long distance, nothing occurs. Of course, the particle is too far away. As we decrease this distance as we bring it down, then the fluorescence starts to increase. Okay, we have more and more and more fluorescence photons. So it goes up, up to a certain point, and then it goes down. And these data points here are fully accounted by, by theory. Uh, this is not an artifact, it goes down. At very short distance, you lose the fluorescence, or at least your fluorescence signal is, is reduced, and, and this goes down. This is what we call fluorescence quenching. So there's a quite complex response, enhancement, and then decrease. Okay, so um, we, we saw there are three parameters to, um, to control the, uh, the fluorescence of, of, uh, of, of, of a single molecule with, with um, nanophotonics. You have excitation intensity, radiative rate, uh, quantum yield, and, and the last one is collection efficiency. So I'm going to go all, on all these three um, uh, effects. So first one, ex excitation intensity enhancement. So this is a gold nanoparticle excited at 633. You have the electrons that are forced to move because the field is polarized. And locally, you can have um, intensity enhancement. And as we go closer and closer and closer to a particle, the enhancement goes up. Okay. Typically, 10, 20, uh, 30, if you go extremely close to, to, to a particle. Okay. So here, it goes up. So that's the first thing. The closer you are to the nanoparticle, the more uh, excitation intensity you have. So the more you're going to pump your molecule. That's quite simple. Then you have all the decay rates, all the decay rates. And, and this is a key message that I, I, I want to, to, to give you today. You have to assume that all photokinetic rates in the Yablonsky diagram, everything is changed when you are close to a, to a metal nanostructure, okay, everything. Excitation rate, you just saw it. Radiative rate, non-radiative rate, um, and then even potentially the intersystem crossing or go, going to some triplet state or, or whatever. Everything potentially can change. You have electrons, uh, the nanoparticles in electron donors, or a lot of things can occur. And actually here you have, um, even for a very simple system, two-level system, the radiative rate evolution, the non-radiative rate evolution, um, and the quantum yield um, effect as you change the, the, the distance, sorry, between the nanoparticle and, uh, and the molecule. So at long distance, nothing occurs. The particle is too far away. And as you reduce the distance, again, it tends to grow up. Okay, this goes up and this goes up also. So two parameters are going to occur. The radiative rate is going to be increased. This is due to the fact that the molecule is going to radiate to a, to a nanoparticle, and this nanoparticle is going to scatter light back to the molecule, and this is going to act as a secondary driving field. So this is going to drive more the molecule and increase its tendency to, to emit photons. So you have an increase in the radiative rate. All right, and, and this typically scales as the distance to a power three. So the closer you go, the higher you go. But at some point, you have also non-radiative increase. As we have seen it, the nanoparticle, it's metal, it can absorb energy. You have an electron flux into the nanoparticle, so you have a current, and then you have uh, ohmic losses. Uh, every time you have a current on, onto a real physical object, and it's not superconducting, then you have uh, a resistance, and then you have ohmic losses. Light um, energy, sorry, is lost into heat. So this, uh, the nanoparticle is going to absorb the, the energy. And then uh, the closer you, ha you go between the, the molecule and the nanoparticle, then the more energy is going to be lost into the nanoparticle. And this is a dipole-dipole interaction. At some very, it's close to threat at some point, if you want, okay? The molecule is the donor, the nanoparticle is the acceptor. 
It's a dipole-dipole interaction. It scales as 1 over the distance to a power 6. So at very short distance, this goes up. And it goes up faster than this one. Okay. This is just dipole. Uh, distance power 3. This is dipole-dipole. Distance power 6. So it goes up faster. And then at some point, you have a trade-off where non-radiative and radiative have the same weight. And at very close distance, typically below 10 nanometer, non-radiative goes faster, and this is where you're going to lose. If you have more loss than gain, then the net result is going down. Total decay rate always goes up. Total decay is just the sum of non-radiative plus radiative. And at the end, this is, I call it radiative efficiency, but this is somehow the, the, the quantum yield of this system, is the ratio of what you want, the radiative, over all the other decays. And here, as you can see, it's pretty efficient at long distance, but then it tends to go down. When this and this have the same weight, you have at 0 0.5, below you go down. So this is going to have a direct influence on, on, your, on your fluorescence uh, signal. At um, long distance, don't gain so much. At some distance, then this is increased a lot, so you gain. You have the excitation intensity is also higher, so it goes up. But if you bring it too close, then at some point you have quenching. The non-radiative takes the lead, and the efficiency goes completely down, and then you lose the fluorescence signal. So if you put a fluorescent dye on the surface of a metal nanoparticle, your fluorescence is going to be quenched. You need to play at a correct distance, typically 10 nanometer. Okay. At 10 nanometer, you, gain, you have a maximum uh, gain from all the system. Okay, this is just by passing. We have seen that um, the lifetime changes as a function of the distance to, um, to the metal. So this uh, has been developed in, in the group of Jörg and Erlein uh, in, in a way to do flim imaging, so fluorescence lifetime imaging, close to a metal uh, surface. Uh, and using the, this um, lifetime, you can then go back to this height, to the distance to a metal film. If the lifetime is reduced as compared to what it should be uh, in, in normal, then uh, from the lifetime reduction, I can buy computing back, I can get back this height and measure um, topography at a nanometer scale. Okay, that was just a parenthesis. Okay, at the end, uh, you have to play with this ratio between radiative and non-radiative rates, uh, and this, again, depends on the distance to the nanoparticle. So you always have this type of, of curves, okay? At short distance, it goes down. It always goes down. Okay. At long distance, there is not so much to, 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 to gain, but then you have this optimum. And this, of course, depends on the initial quantum yield of uh, your fluorescent dye. If your fluorescent dye has a quantum yield of 1%, you cannot gain anything. Okay. The maximum value is 1. You already have 1. So whatever you do on the quantum yield is going to, to induce a loss. Reversibly, if you take a dye that is a pretty weak uh, quantum yield, 1%, 0.1%, then you, here you can increase a lot. If you take this uh, and put it to a quantum yield of 20%, then you can 20. And this is typically what you have here. Okay. So the lower the quantum yield, the higher the gain that you, uh, that you can have. And as gain, you see here the maximum goes up with low quantum yield dyes. So this is pretty interesting because that's a, that's a trick where you can transform a low quantum yield dye into a pretty good emitter. Okay. And finally, the collection efficiency uh, enhancement. Uh, well, here we have a point molecule. We have um, a nanoparticle that is much below half the wavelength, so there's not so much to gain. With this system, if you have a very high NA, the gain in collection efficiency is not going to be so large. So that often people just completely ignore this. Um, just to mention, in some cases, you, you can have um, a control on that if you have a bit larger structures on, on the size of 1 to 2 micron. Uh, here we have a nano aperture with uh, grating around. 
And with that, depending on the number of grooves that we put, we can transform fluorescence light into something that is pretty um, directional. Okay. So we can send all the, almost all the light of a single molecule here into an Na that is 0.3 or so. So that's an example to show you that oh, nanophotonics can also be used to control um, the beaming light. But that requires specific designs. Okay, so that's about one hour, right? I still need to, to go on to the experimental demonstrations. So now we have seen the, the real the, the principles, okay? What's going on with these metal nanoparticles, these electrons, uh, all the rates are changed. And now I want to put this into the microscope. Okay, what's going on when, when, I, when I do this experimental? There's been several uh, demonstration to, to do that. Um, several groups uh, have achieved fluorescence enhancement above 1,000. Okay, you have the group of Bill Murner was the first to go into this thing. Philip Tinefeld has already shown you it, uh, on Tuesday this DNA origami. I will go back on, on, on this one. Uh, in my group and in collaboration with Nick Van Hulst, Maria Garcia Pajaro, uh, we have also achieved a thousand fold enhancement. And also Michel Orit, uh, using a very simple system, just a gold nano rod, also could get a thousand fold. So I'm going to, to detail a bit these four experimental realizations. There are others on the internet, okay? Uh, I don't want to go extensive. I just want to give you examples about what's going on uh, on some practical selected cases. But here already, you see three orders of magnitude more fluorescence photons from my fluorescent bar. Okay, when you want to play this, this type of game and when you want to insert this into your microscope, uh, you have to answer basically two questions. Uh, and, and instead of making a catalog of experiments, I, I want to go and describe a bit more what um, we have a decision that you know, gave rise to this type of, of choice. So two questions, uh, and the, you can read them here. Uh, the first one is, how do I locate my single molecule in my hotspot? Okay. I have a fluorescent molecule. The hotspot is here. This is the plasmonic antenna. I need to put the molecule in the gap. This is where the effect occurs. How do I put this? How do I do this? And then the other problem is then I'm, I'm going to put a lot of molecules around. Uh, these molecules are going to be excited. They are still going to be into the confocal volume. How do I, how will I deal with all this background? How will I maximize the signal from my molecule out of all the rest of the background? So these are really two basic questions. You have your antenna, you put it on your microscope, okay? This is just confocal microscope, you don't change anything. Don't do stead, don't do turf, don't do anything complicated. Just replace the glass cover slip with a glass containing nanophotonics. Then you have your nanophotonic device, and then you want to put your molecule, and you want to have the most signal out of your molecule, and the, last, the, the less background possible. Okay, so the first approach um, that, that is used is just random deposition. You embed everything in a resist, you dilute a lot, you rinse also a lot, and then you just rely. You have thousands of antennas on your system, thousands of molecules, and you go ch cherry picking and you, you go selecting the good ones where the molecules are embedded in, in, in the stuff. So that's very time consuming, but this is also a very clean experiment because then you can do a single molecule. And this is the approach that was taken by in the group of Bill Murner uh, back in 2009. Um, I, I'm not sure you can see all the references because they probably are hidden in, in the, at, at the bottom of the stuff. But anyway, I gave a PDF of the slides so you will be able to, to, to check them. And it's not very difficult to, to see also. If any question, just send me an email. So these are uh, individual TDQPI molecules, okay, uh, diluted in, in the antenna and in some antenna, uh, there will be one located in the gap and here you have the, all the experimental results. So this is the fluorescent enhancement for different antennas. As you can see, there's a broad dispersion of experiments because there's no control on the position of a molecule and no control on the orientation of the molecule. Okay. So the molecule to have the highest enhancement, the molecule has to be in the gap and the dipole of the molecule has to be oriented along this dimer. Okay. So if the molecule is here with the correct orientation, it will give the maximum enhancement. 
If a molecule is here, but with an orientation that, that is perpendicular, uh, then it's not going to be efficiently excited and not going to, to emit efficiently, and probably it can go down with this type of experiments, if it is detected. Anyway, there are still, this is was still uh, the first very convincing experiment of single molecule in a plasmonic nano antenna uh, with very large fluorescence enhancement. Uh, as you can see here, the counts in confocal are just a few counts within the, the beginning time, and here this has been increased by a thousand fold. Okay. Of course, you have a large background, but still you have a single step photo bleaching and a large dispersion. But this is it's possible. Again, quantum yield, as you can see here, 2.5 percent. Okay, we take a low quantum yield to really maximize the, the fluorescence gain. If you take a high quantum yield dye, you'll never reach to 1,000. Okay, the other approach, uh, and it's much more elegant and much more powerful to, to locate the single molecule in the hotspot, is the DNA origami, uh, as what was introduced by Philippe Tinefeld. Uh, and this is a very, very powerful approach. Um, it was already told, um, you were told about uh, last Tuesday by, by Philippe. But I, I want to again go back in, into this context. Um, so here, um, you have a DNA origami, okay, which is going to stand as a pillar, and this pillar will be able to locate, to graft nanoparticles. So two nanoparticles separated by the width of the pillar. You know where the, the, the molecule, the nanoparticles are going to be grafted on, on, on the DNA. You can control also their, their distances. And here also on the DNA, uh, uh, and this is the, the strength, the key strength of the method, is that you are able to have recognition sites for your fluorescent molecule of interest. Okay. You can also graph a protein if, if you want, if, 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 by, by changing the, the, D, the DNA chemistry here. So there you have single molecules that are um, able to bind to the DNA and feel indirectly in the hotspot of the nanoparticles. Okay. And again, as you can see, the signal on the nano antenna is very intense, short lifetime, as compared to what you can have in confocal. The signal is much weaker and lifetime um, also orders of magnitude longer. Okay. And again, a reduction of lifetime because radiative and non-radiative decay rate enhancement and enhancement in fluorescence. Okay, so that was obtained with um, ATO 647N, uh, so a high, much higher quantum yield. The fluorescence enhancement is less, but still you gain uh, up to 100 uh, on this type of, of, of designs. Okay, the nice thing here is that everything is deterministic uh, on the coupling between the molecule and the antenna. Okay, the last point, uh, and probably also the easiest, um, but that uh, uh, we do in, in our group, and that also is, is followed by, by the group of Michel Orit, is just rely on free diffusion. Okay, just have the molecules in solution and let the vein move, Brownian diffusion. In this case, uh, you have to be ca really careful about the background because this is typically what you, what you do, okay? You work at high concentration. You want to make sure there's a molecule in the hotspot. Problem number one, the hotspot volume is small, 10 zeptoliter, okay? 10 minus 20 liter, um, a really small fraction of micron cube. So to make sure that you have one molecule here, you need to increase the concentration. And this is also what we wanted to do. We wanted to do a single molecule at high concentrations of several tens of hundreds of micromolar. The issue in this case is that you will have also a lot of molecules in your confocal volume. This is still a confocal microscope, diffraction limited spot, okay, so 0.5 femtoliter. In this case, at high concentrations, you have several thousands of molecules that are still there. And this is going to give you a lot of fluorescence background. Okay. These molecules, the blue ones, are in the confocal volume. They are going to be excited by the laser. They are going to emit light, not enhanced, but because there are many, then the signal is going to be a lot. Say differently, I have one molecule in the hotspot. It's enhanced a thousand times. So I have a signal of 1,000. But this signal I have to compare to all the other molecules. I have 50,000 of other molecules and are not going to be enhanced. Their signal is going to be one. 
but 50,000 molecules giving a signal of one gives me a, a total net signal of 50,000. And that I have to compare to the 1,000 I get on the hotspot. And as you can see here, this, is, this ratio is very detrimental. So we have to play tricks for that. Of course, we can reduce the concentration again, but still at some point, the, um, this change in volume, uh, we have to, to deal with it. So the trick uh, uh, to reduce this background contribution is to, low, to use low quantum yield dyes. Okay. Reduce the quantum yield. Uh, and as I've shown you already, uh, if you have a high quantum yield system, you can only, you cannot gain. You will only gain from the collection and the excitation rate, but not more. If you have a low quantum yield system, then you can also will you will benefit from the increase in the radiative rate. So your net total fluorescence enhancement is going to be much higher. So we'll increase the fluorescence enhancement and also lower the background contribution. Another um, slide telling you exactly the same message. This is from the group of Philip Tinefeld uh, uh, again. This is the initial quantum yield of your molecule, okay? With, without the, the, nan the nanostructure, just pure homogeneous buffer so solution. And this is the quantum yield of the molecule in the antenna hotspot, okay? So if I take a, a high quantum yield dye, and I put off 0 0.9, I put it into the, um, the, the antenna, uh, then its quantum yield is going to be actually reduced because of, of the non radiative losses, and it's going to be around 0 0.8, something like that. But the very nice thing is that this curve actually is pretty flat down to this range, okay? It's pretty, pretty flat. This tells you that whatever the quantum yield that you use between 0 0.1 and 100%, the quantum yield in the antenna is going to be the same. It's going to be around 0 0.8, okay? So use a good dye, you finish with 0 0.8 quantum yield. Use a bad dye, you finish with 0 0.8 quantum yield. So that's very interesting and that's a very strong motivation for using low quantum yield systems because here I start from a high value, I end up with something lower, but here I start with something that is 0 0.8 I, uh, sorry, 0 0.08, at the end, I end up with something that is 10 times bigger. So here I gain a lot. I can get a factor of 10 or even higher. All right, so that's the, the beauty of um, the nanophotonics enhancement of the decay rates, is that you can increase uh, the fluorescence, uh, the quantum yield a, a lot in these key times, which is going to be a very interesting because it's going to lower the, um, the background also. So you maximize the information from your hotspot and you, at the same time, you minimize what's coming up from the, the contribution from the top. Okay, this is a, a, an experiment by, by the group of Michel Orit, just using colloidal um, uh, gold nanorods. So you can buy them, these are commercial, you can disperse them on the cover slip. You cannot make anything simpler as nano fabrication of, of, of a nano antenna, okay? And this is really designed to detect single fluorescent molecules in a solution. So that was done with crystal violet. Uh, crystal violet has a quantum yield of 2%, uh, and, and this is really ideal to take maximum benefit from the fluorescence enhancement and, 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 and minimize the background contribution, okay? Again, in the best case, you can have a thousand-fold fluorescence enhancement. Uh, we have also played this trick uh, using a quencher, so you can add um, methyl halogen to your buffer solution. If you add it to some, depending on the concentration, uh, you will decrease and the fluorescence quantum yield. You still have the benefit of a high absorption cross section, but you just uh, increase the, the, the quenching rate and, and decrease the quantum yield. So with that type of, of trick, we can take Alexa 647 and have it at a quantum uh, yield of, of 8%. Okay, and, but we were playing with this type of, of system, uh, decreasing the, um, uh, using gold nanoparticles dried on, on a substrate. They can make pretty small gaps, six nanometer, and again, we can have fluorescence enhancement. 
Okay, uh, very briefly in, in, in the last five minutes, uh, I, want, I want to show you some other approaches. Um, again, playing with free diffusion. To cancel out the background here, we can add um, a metal film. And, and this is the concept of um, some more advanced nanofabrication we, we use. Um, a metal film around to um, avoid direct excitation of all the molecules that are on top. So we call it antenna in box. Uh, we have uh, the two nanoparticles creating the antenna with the hotspot used for fluorescence enhancement. And then a metal cladding, just to avoid exciting all the molecules that are on top. With this type of thing, then you can have, again, fluorescence enhancement above uh, a thousand fold, very strong uh, volume reduction, so that you can do single molecule experiments at concentrations of several tenths of micromolar. And here, I, I want to also to address uh, another question. Because at some point, you, you're, you're going to tell me, yes, but you play with a low quantum yield. But I don't care about your enhancement. I care about the photon flux. I care about how much detection events I have per second. Well, here you have the, the, the type of the experiment. So this is Alexa 647 at a given excitation power, typically 10 microwatts, something, something like that. Uh, so this is the brightness that we detect in our confocal microscope with Alexa quantum yield um, 30%. When we add the quencher, then of course we lose a factor of four um, or, or, or more on, on, on this system. With the antenna, and you have to focus on these things, uh, we are going to get this one enhanced by a thousand fold, okay? three orders of magnitude. We're going to take this one because it has a higher quantum yield, it will benefit less, so the enhancement is going to be a bit less. Okay. But at the end, the message that we have is that the count rates are still super high, okay. are still much higher than whatever you can have in the solution reference. And actually, it's even slightly better, I'm still a bit surprised by this result, but uh, still better with a low quantum yield dye. So take a low quantum yield dye, and at the end, you turn it into something that is brighter than that something already pretty bright. Okay, so at the end, what matters is really the count rate per molecule, and this uh, you still gain. And that's, this is where, where, where it's interesting to use such device. Okay, so recently we pushed it even further where we've uh, advanced electron beam lithography, planar substrate, control of very small gaps, uh, playing with low quantum yield systems, then again, we can have super high fluorescence enhancement. But again, these values are intrinsically linked to the quantum yield that we use. All right, so that's the answering the various, the two questions we had. So random deposition in a polymer, if you, if you really want to, to probe what's going on. Docking site, if you want to deterministically uh, couple the molecule to your, your, your nano gap. Free diffusion is a very easy way to go, and you can do a lot of things with that. Uh, and then you to play with um, signal to noise ratio, then using a low quantum yield dye is a pretty efficient trick to maximize the signal you have from a single molecule and reduce the background contribution. So at the end, if we compare everything, um, uh, we can plot the figure of, um, mm. not the fluorescence enhancement, but the figure of merit, which is the ratio of the fluorescence enhancement by the quantum yield to avoid a bit there, these, these changes, and, and also as a function of the detection volume. So as you can see, origami, antenna, and box, both are very, very more or less lie in the same system. Of course, if you use single particle or non-rod, the performance is going to be a bit lower, but hey, you can still play with, with some, um, you can still gain from, from this, and it's very simple. A nanorod, colloidal, commercially available, you put it on a cover slip, it's extremely easy to, to do so. Gold dimers also are pretty easy. If you just go around them, the position, set a good concentration, and you can have this nano antenna uh, available pretty easy. So it's not that complicated. Okay. Um, two other extensions, uh, and I'm going to conclude. Um, extending to the blue and the green, because so far what I've shown you is playing with gold. Gold is very efficient 
uh, above 600 nanometer, uh, but below it's not so good. Uh, gold is, looks yellow, so of course it's absorbing blue and green. So if you want to play with blue and green dyes, then you have to extend um, the, the spectral range, uh, extend it with other metals, so silver. And here we have a demonstration by the group of Philip Tinefeld, Guillermo Acuna, uh, performing better in the blue-green range. And also, you can also have uh, antennas milled in aluminum. Uh, and uh, antenna in aluminum will also work and also give you uh, fluorescence enhancement. Of course, it's less performant than gold. But if you want to play in the green or in the blue, then you have to change and you cannot use gold anymore anyway. Two other parameters interesting is that you can change all the photokinetic rates. And this is very, very fascinating um, and very promising. But you can also improve photostability. Because the lifetime is shorter, then the dye has less probability to go to some triplet or, 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 or to, 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 to go oxidation. Okay? You reduce the lifetime by a factor of 100. So you, every time the molecule is in the excited state, you bring it faster to the ground state. And this will promote your photostability. Okay. On the other hand, you will also increase locally the excitation rate. So uh, you will also send more photon flux to your molecule. But this is very interesting, but it was shown by the group of Philip Tinefel. If you take a Psi-5 molecule coupled to a single nanoparticle, you can increase the total photon budget by a factor of four. Okay. So taking advantage of the enhancement and improving the photostability of the dye will give you a total net but uh, photon uh, number that is much higher. And something also very, very funny uh, in the same range um, is observing triplet blinking. Uh, again, we reduce a lot the fluorescent lifetime, so we take down the dye to the ground state every time it's excited. Um, I do not say that we change the intersystem crossing rate. I don't think we, we affect it, but we do not see it anymore. Uh, because this is a Alexa Fluor 647, just uh, cyanine dye equivalent to Psi 5. Uh, typically, you see um, uh, photoisomerization and triplet blinking at microsecond scale. But when you put it in the antenna, then you don't see this anymore. Because every time the molecule is excited, it's going to emit a photon and go down to the ground state 100 times faster than here. So it, it, you do not see so much the, the triplet blinking in these cases. So it's another way to change the observation of photodynamics. That's another illustration that all photodynamic rates and all observable that you can do are potentially changed. OK, alternatives, I don't go on that. Uh, if you're interested, you can see the PDF. Uh, you can send me an email. Uh, you have nano holes. Um, you have microspheres. Uh, you have even endoscopes with single molecule sensitivity, plenty of things that you can do. Uh, you can increase the volume. Um, you can do sensing down to the single molecule. So this is label-free single molecule, a uh, group of Karsten Sonicsen, uh, pretty promising system also. And SERS is still not dead, okay? So don't forget also about SERS. If you want to do single molecule, it's still possible to, to, to do this and label-free. So there's not only fluorescence in the lab. Okay, that's, that's it. That was the menu I promised that will take you through all this. Um, Nano-optics, enhancements, demonstration how-to, uh, alternatives. Uh, we will discuss that in an alternative talk. So my take-home message is nanophotonics is, is now mature enough. Okay, It's a way um, that allows you quite easily to manipulate light at a scale that is below the wavelength. Okay, so diffraction limit is no longer a limit. You can concentrate light on, on, on a nanospot, okay, down to the size of the molecule, typically. So with that, you can increase significantly the fluorescence per molecule. So you can have more f uh, fluorescence signal from your molecule. You can also affect the lifetime. You can also affect the photostability of your, of your molecules. So all photokinetic rates can potentially be changed. But it can yield to the good point that you have more photons per molecule. And at the end of the day, this is still what you want to get, uh, getting as many fluorescent photons. The other advantage is that now you have no longer limited by the concentration. Okay? 
detecting a single molecule, you don't have to do it in nanomolar concentration. You can go and monitor a single molecule at a concentration higher than 10 micromolars. So it can, you can increase by 10,000 fold the operation concentration and still look at a single molecule in a crowd. So go single in, in a very dense environment. And fabrication, okay, you have various approaches. You, you, ca you can do by um, lithography. So this is the top-down E-beam, focused ion beam. Uh, you can do use DNA origami, and you can also use just a single nanoparticle. You can also use a single nanorod. These are pretty efficient um, approach, very easy to implement. Nano apertures also are easy to fabricate. You can get them easy. And, and finally, some other um, extra um, messages. Don't compare between fluorescence enhancement factors. There is no race in fluorescence enhancement. This is so much dependent on the initial quantum yield that you use, it's difficult to compare. Okay, so don't believe if people tell you uh, fluorescence enhancement 100,000 fold. Um, okay, it depends on the setup that, that you play. What counts is the net photon flux. Don't confuse lifetime reduction and fluorescence enhancement, obviously. And okay, maybe it's uh, also time for us to go back to these low quantum yield dyes that we somehow forgot or, over all these years, focusing on high bright systems. But low quantum yield dyes, you can make them now much, much brighter with the, the nano antennas. Okay, and with this, I thank you for your attention. What about application in cells? Um, application in, in, in cells, uh, I don't know if I have this on, on, on this slide. Uh, this is some, some new uh, applications that, that we are trying to do. Uh, so you can, you can play with FCS on these things. Um, I don't have the cells here. Oh. Mistake. Um, Yes, we, uh, it's, it's possible. Actually, um, it did, uh, ah, okay, let's, let's play with that. How this will work? Okay. So here we are taking advantage of uh, planar nano antennas that we have designed to investigate membranes. Uh, so what's, these nano antennas are very in interesting to investigate the membranes um, of living cells because the membrane is going to be in very close contact to the hotspot. Okay. So I don't know wh whether the question was about application inside living cells. So that's a much more tricky question to, to incorporate these nanoparticles um, uh, in, in, into it. But if you, if you want to investigate the membrane, and there's a lot of things to do in, with the membrane to understand the, the architecture and, and properties of them, then with these nano antennas, you can have uh, illumination spots that are much below the wavelength of light. Okay, so you are no longer limited by diffraction, and you can probe the diffusion of uh, fluorescent lipids or fluorescent proteins in the membrane of living cells. Uh, and that was some work that, that, that is ongoing um, within the group of Maria Garcia Parajo at ICFO. Um, this is a, a simple. Uh, example calibration on, on a pure DOPC uh, by layer uh, to show you that we are able to probe diffusion of um, fluorescent dyes down to spot size of a few hundred of nanometer square. So several orders of magnitude below the diffraction limit. And that was extended to um, uh, more complex uh, lipid by layers and also to uh, living cells. Okay, another question. so well. You can also have that the molecule is attached and detached. Okay, so you have 
this, this fluctuation can not only be related to, uh, to blinking, uh, to an uh, inter-system crossing, but it can also be due to some fluctuation in the orientation or position of the die. Because this is so sensitive, uh, especially to orientation, if uh, the, um, the molecule turns um, by 45 degrees, it's going to have a huge influence on, on the net fluorescence signal. So not all blinking are related to photokinetics. In it tells you something of the, uh, the mo molecule, of course, but it's not only um, affected by, by the photokinetics. Especially in the case of crystal violet and, and, and nanorods, there was a lot of sticking uh, between crystal violet. Uh, crystal violet is quite prone to stick on, on, on gold. So there was a lot of, of sticking. So in this case, you have, you have peaks. But may maybe if, if I want to uh, go better, all these peaks here, these are individual molecules going in and out. Okay? So these are molecules uh, diffusing around. Um, actually, they, every peak here is a uh, detection event of a molecule sticking there and going released. Yes, well, uh, that's, that's more a comment than, 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 than a question, uh, I agree. Um, actually, it's a bit difficult for us to measure the inter-system crossing rate. Um, we, can, we can try with, with it, but uh, since the lifetime is, is much shorter, uh, we don't see much things, uh, and especially for, for this experiment. Uh, unfortunately, here this was done with methyl valogen, so the lifetime already is pretty short. 400 picoseconds, but we saw it also without methyl valogen, so in, in all cases. Um, so I agree that we have to be careful about this inter-system crossing, um, but now it turns out in, into some more complex case that for the, the most powerful antenna that we have, uh, we cannot measure this anymore. Uh, actually, everything goes so fast that we, uh, we don't see this type of thing, of thing ongoing. But, but I agree, um, this photostability is very promising, uh, and this has to be uh, investigated more. But at the end, this tells you the, the, the net gain that you can have with, this, with such systems. OK. okay. No, no problem. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for setting this. Uh, sorry for Skype, is a bit complicated. Okay, okay. so that's fine. Okay. So bye bye. Thank if you, you like this video, put a thumbs up and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, bye. Take care. And say hi to your girl. Bye bye.